Well, hello. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Norwich Bookstore, and thank you so much to all of you for being here uh, and, and filling this, this house of books with wonderful people, with wonderful community members. This is truly a community space, and it feels the most that way when we have our friends and neighbors in it. So thank you, all of you. My name is Sam. Some of you may recognize me from behind the counter at the store or from other author events. Mm -hmm. I'm one of the co-owners of the Norwich Bookstore, and I am, uh, on behalf of all of us here, again, delighted to welcome you. And I'm going to direct your attention to the thing we're really here to celebrate tonight, and that is books! <laughs> Specifically this one. This is a copy of The Drowning Sea. It is brand new. It is the latest in the Maggie to R.C. Mystery Series, and it came out today. We pulled them out of the box this morning. So this is the first day that you can get this book. You are gonna want it by the end of this evening if you haven't reserved your copy already. And I got gotcha. you. We got books up front here. We got books in the front room on the counter. We got books in boxes downstairs. We'll go for books all night. And let me tell you something about books. They are kind of what makes this whole thing happen. They are what keeps the lights on in this store. They're what keeps this programming going. They are also what allows your favorite authors like Sarah Stewart Taylor to keep writing and keep working and keep producing these great series that you love. So, tonight, your book, it supports all of that and you get a great book out of the deal. Everybody wins. I strongly encourage you to, to pick up a book and Sarah would be happy to sign, inscribe, personalize as you see fit. And we thank you again so much for your support. If you enjoyed tonight's event, you want to see what else we've got going on, please sign up for our email newsletter see what else we've got coming up. We are usually doing a couple of author events a week, many of them happening right here in this space, some of them happening online, some of them happening at various venues around town, and uh, we'd love to see you again, uh, so please do check out what else we've got happening. We send a weekly email telling you what the latest is. And now, without further ado, the main attraction. I am so <laughs> delighted tonight to welcome Sarah Stewart Taylor. It was just about a year ago that we were gathering on Zoom to uh, launch this book in hardcover. Uh, this also just came out in paperback today. This is Maggie Darcy number two, uh, A Distant Grave, now in paperback if you haven't read it. Uh, and I think at the end of that event, I said next, next year we'll be in the store. And you're about the first author, I think, who I've been able to make, that, make good on that promise for. We are so glad <laughs> to be able to welcome Sarah Stewart Taylor to our store tonight. On the eve of the release, Sarah Stewart Taylor is the author of the Sweeney St. George series and, of course, the Maggie D'Arcy series. She grew up on Long Island in New York and was educated at Middlebury College. And Huntington represents. Huntington represents here in this room, yeah. Uh, some of you may know that my business partner is from Northport. Uh, oh, business at my home. I didn't know that. Did you know that? No. Emma's from Northport. Emma's from you can Northport. Die. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. We go back to Northport a lot. Uh, she was educated at Middlebury College and at Trinity College in Dublin. And she lived in Dublin, Ireland in the mid 90s. She now lives with her family on a farm right here in Vermont. Vermont. And I'll tell you just a quick little anecdote <laughs> that I think illustrates something about the character who is Sarah Stewart Taylor that I meet a lot of authors who say, oh yeah, you know, she's a really great writer and I didn't know she was such a good farmer as well. <laughs> but I have now had more than two conversations with people in this store who said, you know, I know this farmer. She's a really great farmer, and I had no idea she wrote novels! <laughs> Takes all kinds. We are so delighted to welcome you here tonight, Sarah Stewart Taylor, author of The Drowning Sea. Please, ladies and gentlemen, give me a warm welcome. Thank you so much. It's so great to be here, and um, I love the uh, I love the anecdote. I think Matt, my husband, who's sitting here, who who keeps track of our farm finances, is raising his eyebrows about whether if if by good farmer you mean spends a lot of money on the farming. Maybe maybe that would be true. It is so great to see you all here. This is so much fun, and it is all. It's so great to see old friends and people I don't know. And then to have my family here, my parents and uh, Matt and all three kids are here and the Huntington crew and my book group <laughs> and woo, the book group, the, the, I can't call it the Heartland book group because there are other towns represented, although Heartland is very heavily represented in our book group. 
And then I know I saw a plain, uh, the Plainfield Book Group is here. <laughs> Woo, represent. My, uh, my writer, I, 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 the only way I can refer to you guys is my writer donut church people, which it, nobody else will understand, but it's our thing. Um, they're here. And uh, a new friends, an, an amazing, another amazing writer who just walked in at the back of the room there. It's so great to see you all. And um, thank you for coming out tonight. And it's so great to be in person. Um, you know, Zoom, I think Zoom in so many ways was, was wonderful and it allowed us to meet with people, you know, all over the country and certainly for safety's sake and for people who, you know, who need Zoom, I think Zoom can be great. And I'm, I'm doing a few more virtual events this year, but I have to tell you, there's nothing like looking people in the eye and, <laughs> and you know, saying hello and signing, signing a book and feeling your pen on the paper. And um, it's, just, it's just really wonderful to be, to be launching in person this year. So thanks for being a part of that. So Sam gave a, a great introduction. And um, The Drowning Sea, which is out today, let's see, I oh, I'm going to grab one that I can hold up because authors are always supposed to hold up their book. And I took the cover off my reading copy. <laughs> Um, the Drowning Sea. Um, so The Drowning Sea is the third in the Maggie Darcy series. And um, the Maggie Darcy series really, it, 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 it's been a long time coming, um, is sort of the way I describe it when people ask what the inspiration for the series was. Um, you know, I think the seeds of this series about an American homicide detective um, detecting and uh, exploring and falling in love and doing lots of other things in Ireland, um, the seeds were planted in, in the mid-90s, um, as Sam referenced, when I was living there and working there and going to graduate school. And um, I became aware of a, uh, a series of disappearances, uh, really tragic disappearances of women in Ireland. And um, the cases, even after I moved, back to the States, these cases really haunted me. And I just, you know, I thought about them over the years uh, so much. Um, there were some strange sort of connections. Uh, the first woman who disappeared was actually uh, from a woman from Long Island who was living in Ireland. And, and then there were, you know, a number of Irish women. And th those cases have never been solved. Um, you know, the, the Gardaí in Ireland have never been able to figure out who uh, who, who took those women, um, and their remains have never been found. And so for the families, you know, it's just this, this torturous thing of not knowing. And I, that was the thing that sort of lodged itself in my brain, I think, thinking about the families over all of those years. And, you know, I think for many years, I didn't want to write the story um, I, for a lot of reasons. It felt, uh, it felt, very risky. And it, it really was sort of 20 years after I, I was living in Ireland that I started to think about the character of Maggie Darcy, um, a young American woman who goes to Ireland to try to find her cousin, her beloved cousin. Um, she can't find her cousin, and she goes home. And 23 years later, She's become a homicide detective largely because of this experience, because she couldn't solve her cousin's case. And she returns to Ireland to see if she can solve the case once and for all. New evidence is found, and she goes back. And um, that book, of course, was The Mountains Wild. And um, I didn't really think that I would write a second book about Maggie. I thought, you know, I wrote The Mountains Wild. Um, it was set in Dublin and in and around Wicklow and the Wicklow Mountains, and those were places I loved and knew well, and I sort of felt like I had, you know, I had said, I, I thought I had said what I wanted to say. And after I sold the book, my editor said, you know, what do you think? Do you think you could turn it into a series? And at first, I was very... Uh, I, very against it, actually. I think I, my first answer was no. But then I hung up the phone and I started thinking about all of the other places in Ireland that I love and where I could set mysteries. <laughs> and um, I started to think about how I could take Maggie back. And of course, at the end of The Mountains Wild, there's a, 
you know, there's a love, a love connection that's sort of hanging out there. And so I, I thought, well, you know, I think I, I think I can get her back there. Um, and so uh, the distant grave and now the drowning sea um, are kind of the continuation of Maggie's story. Um, in a distant grave, she uh, had to solve a case on Long Island that had some tentacles uh, it also in Ireland. Um, and in the Drowning Sea, uh, she and her daughter Lily uh, are have moved to Ireland for the summer, and they're they're going to figure out if they want to be there full time. So they are uh, renting a cottage on a remote uh, uh, and beautiful West Cork Peninsula for the summer um, with Maggie's boyfriend Connor and his son Adrian. And um, you know Maggie has has left her job as a homicide detective back on Long Island, but uh, the, the crime investigation energy is uh, still, <laughs> still very much with her. And um, when some mysterious things happen on the peninsula, she kind of gets dragged back in to, uh, to detecting. So I thought I would read to you from um, fairly close to the beginning of the book, just to kind of give you a, a feel for uh, what's happening in the Drowning Sea. And I should say that the title, um, the title comes from a poem uh, by Robert Francis that some of you might know called Swimmer. Um, and I think I'll, I'll just start and read um, the, first, um, the first part of the poem because it, it's a poem that has a lot of sort of thematic resonance in the book. Swimmer by Robert Francis. Observe how he negotiates his way with trust and the least violence, making the stranger friend, the enemy ally. The depth that could destroy gently supports him. With water, he defends himself from water. Danger he leans on, rests in. The drowning sea is all he has between himself and drowning. All right, and then um, all you need to know, um, Maggie and Connor and uh, Maggie's daughter Lily and Connor's son Adrian have been out walking on this, this peninsula. Um, Ross Head is the name of the peninsula. They've been out walking. It's, you know, gorgeous cliffs, Ireland, wind, all the things you would imagine, you know, crashing sea below the cliff. And um, Maggie and Lily get into a bit of an argument. Um, they're, you know, as teenagers, as you may know, don't always agree with their parents. <laughs> and um, of course, I had to, I had to go into a lot of research because my teenagers <laughs> always agree with me, so I couldn't rely on any of my own personal experience. Um, so, uh, so they've they've had a bit of an argument, and. Um, Lily runs off back to the cottage and Maggie's kind of alone on the peninsula and she decides to go visit their landlady and buy some bread and, and eggs. All right. I stop myself from sprinting after her and let her go, telling myself she'll cool down. She disappears into the tall grass. So quickly, it shakes me a little. Letting the wind flow over my face, calming my heart rate, I stand there looking out at the view for a moment. It's stunning, all the visual elements combining to form a pleasing composition. But suddenly, I'm aware of the sharp angles of the high cliffs, the treacherous distance down to the water. And when I look back at Rosscliff House, checking the uppermost windows to see if I can figure out what optical illusion made Lily and Adrian think there was someone up there, all I can see is the dark bulk of it, imposing and vaguely threatening against the endless ocean. I walk slowly along the road ringing the peninsula, feeling lucky to be here, despite Lily's mood and my own uneasiness. Connor and I were planning on staying in his colleague and friend Grace Murphy's house on Rosshead for a week back in the winter, before the last case I worked wrecked our vacation plans and left me unemployed for the first time in my adult life. This summer was supposed to be a do-over, since Grace and her husband Lorcan were going to be in France. 
but at the last minute they decided to spend the summer in West Cork and put us in touch with a woman named Lissa, Crawf Lissa Crawford, who owns the three cottages. A cancellation meant ours was available for July and August. She's a bit eccentric, Lissa Crawford, Grace told Connor, once we decided to sign the lease. Quite a talented painter, but she's odd. She says odd things, you'll see. She sells fresh eggs and does a good brown bread, though. The cottages are lovely, and you'll be close to us. There's a bit of social life on the peninsula, and the village is lively enough now. Sam Nevin, who built our house and the other houses on Rosshead, has been investing in Rosscliff, trying to make it a real tourist destination, like the other towns and villages in that part of West Cork. She explained that Lorcan, who's a banker in Dublin, has been helping Nevin put together investors to finance the holiday development and the fund for the hotel renovation. Lissa Crawford lives in the biggest of the three cottages, a cheery whitewashed one story surrounded by flower beds and a chicken coop with a glass walled extension that she uses as a painting studio. We met her the day we arrived when we stopped by to get the key. As we waited in the entryway for her to fetch it, we all looked around in astonishment. The walls were crowded with her paintings, abstract compositions with bright flashes of color that reminded me of Rorschach inkblots. In their simple frames, they climbed the white walls like glorious stains, spilled wine or paint, candle wax on a tablecloth. She was wearing an artist's smock covered in paint, her braided silver and yellow hair on top of her head, and a long strand of glass beads in bright colors around her neck. I turned 46 in March, and I take her for only five or 10 years older than me, but she seems both much older and somehow ageless, enveloped in a cloud of creative energy and the bright colors of her work. Lily and I walked down the day after we arrived to buy a loaf of bread from her, and she showed us her paintings as her chickens clucked outside the open windows. Walking home with the loaf of still warm bread, Lily said, that's how I want to be when I'm older. Like, just don't give a shit, you know? I smiled at her. How do you know she doesn't give a shit? You can just tell, right? Like her hair, and she's just like doing her thing, painting her paintings. She doesn't have a husband or anything. She's her own person. I don't have a husband, I said. But you have Connor, and you wear like regular mom clothes. <laughs> she gestured dismissively at my jeans and tank top and I took the comparison as a criticism. I wasn't bohemian enough. I didn't dress right. And lately, Lily had been communicating strongly that she finds my job vaguely fascist. <laughs> I sigh. I'm in one of the most beautiful places on earth with a teenage daughter who seems intent on making me feel bad about myself any way she can. As I approach Lissa Crawford's cottage, though, I see something that makes me forget about Lily's digs at my clothes and job. There's a car, still running, parked in front of the cottage, and a man and a woman, he in a dark blue Garda uniform, she in plain clothes, are standing outside talking to Lissa. The Garda Shiakana is Ireland's national police service, and I assume the woman in plain clothes is a detective. I can read the scene, the tension in all three bodies, the crackling of a radio through the open window of one of the cars. This isn't just a social visit. These guards, as officers are called here, are responding to a call or an incident. Something's happened. They've seen me now, and Lissa gestures toward me and seems to be explaining something. They all look up in expectation. Is everything all, all right, I call out? This is Annie Tobin, Lissa says as I come closer, pointing to the woman in plain clothes. Detective Sergeant Ann Tobin, the woman says. I'm a guard of detective posted in Bantry, but I live here in Rosscliff. Uh, she's, my, she's my height and my age, with brown hair silvering at her temples and cut in a no-nonsense but still stylish short bob and sad brown eyes that turn to take me in. Her outfit is too big on her, her blue linen blouse loose and baggy as though she's lost weight suddenly. The young guy next to her, awkwardly tall and thin, 
rocks back on his heels a bit as she introduces him as Garda Broom. He's not comfortable in his uniform yet. He keeps fiddling with the waistband of his pants. Mrs. Darcy is renting the middle cottage for the summer, Lissa explains. They've only just arrived. She's a police detective as well. I don't know how she knows this. Grace must have told her. Hoban nods. I've just been telling Lissa that we'll be conducting a search on Rosshead today. Unfortunately, a Belgian tourist found um, human remains down on Crescent Beach this morning. Crescent Beach is a popular swimming spot close to Rosshead. Oh, how awful, I say. Do they know who it is? Lissa jumps in before Tobin can say anything, talking too fast, tucking a strand of hair back up into her bun. She's upset, I think, babbling to stave off strong emotion, fear, or sadness. There was, there was a young man, Lucas, who worked for Sam Nevin on the building sites. Such a nice lad. He disappeared, and they thought he went back to Poland in April, but it looks like maybe he, he didn't, she says, her eyes wide. Oh, poor Lucas. And I'll stop there. With poor, with poor Lucas. So you'll have to read to find out what happened to poor Lucas. Um, so I would love to answer questions if people have them or if there's anything that, um, that you would like me to talk more about. Um, I, I, one thing that um, I've, has been on my mind a lot lately, because I just finished it, is that I just finished the fourth book in the series. Um, and turned it into my editor on June 1st. So she's reading it right now, and I have, I don't know what she thinks, we'll find out, but um, it's a, hopefully same time next year, yeah, assuming she likes it. The fourth one is set, uh, is Maggie's back in Dublin, and she's, um, she's sort of trying to, to, to settle in. It's not a spoiler to say that she's trying to settle in at the beginning of, of book four, and um, it was really fun because I, I hadn't, you know, I hadn't been able to do a research trip in a while. And in November, I was finally able to go over and um, do, a, do a trip. And I, uh, I spent most of my time sort of, you know, deeply researching one particular Dublin neighborhood that is going to be the setting for the book. And um, it was, you know, I think after the sort of, you know, West Cork, Peninsula out in out in the wilderness. It was really fun to do a, a city book um, next, so I'm excited about that, and I'll keep you all updated on the progress of that book, which is as yet um, untitled. Or I have a title, but it hasn't been. As the writers in the room know, titles can be very troublesome <laughs> between authors and editors, <laughs> and uh, sometimes it takes a while to settle on something. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, so yeah, what what questions uh, might might people have, or might you want me to talk a little bit more about? Jason, I'm curious about. Like, I know it probably varies from book to book, but like in general, how your process works in terms of like coming up with an idea for like, is there a way that you approach a murder, <laughs> a homicide? Um, in terms of like, like where does the story start? Does it start with, in general, does it start with the specific crime and then you build out from there? Or does it start, or do other things inspire? Like I, I'm curious to know for each of these books, like what was the seed that got you going? Yeah, so, um, so I always, I think I always start with setting. You know, like I know, I know the, the setting of the book and I know where, you know, I know like where the, the murder is gonna be. Um, and for me, everything really comes out of setting. That's, uh, that's kind of, I think, my most important decision and my, my first decision. Um, so you and, decide, sorry, yeah. you decide where you want it to happen, and then you go and just absorb as much as possible? Yeah, yeah, and usually, usually I'll start with, um, you know, usually I'll start with a sort of, it's very cinematic, actually. Like, I'll start with sort of a scene in my head that's kind of the, the, starting off point for the whole book. And at that point, I'll have the setting. But, you know, so for, um, for A Distant Grave, I knew, I just had this idea that there was this body on a beach um, on, you know, the south shore of Long Island. 
Um, and I put I put the the murder in Bayshore. Sorry if anyone here is from Bayshore. I, <laughs> there is something terrible does happen in Northport in one of the books. So I, Emma, I'm so sorry. I didn't know. Um, but I yeah I just sort of had this image of this of the body on the beach, and you know this idea that Maggie would re respond in in her role as a homicide detective, and then there would be this link, you know that the man would be. And I, I, for some reason, I just right from the beginning, I had this idea that he was an Irish aid worker. And so, and I don't know exactly why. I don't, you know, I had a friend who, who did some humanitarian aid work who was Irish, and I was kind of interested in how, how overrepresented in many ways um, Irish people are in that work. You know, if you, like, if you watch the BBC in, in a hot spot, you often will hear a ton of Irish accents among the people who are doing that work. And there are some really interesting, reasons for that um, related to the church and related to uh, you know, emigration patterns and seeking work outside of Ireland in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. So there are all there are really interesting reasons for that. But that was sort of where that book started. And then I had to figure out, OK, so there, this guy's on the beach. You know, how did he get there? Why was he there? And, and that's where the backstory and kind of the, the plot and the the murder part of it comes in, and of course, who who put him there? Um, so yeah, and you know, I think so. It really, it really starts the setting, and then this this kind of scene that is the the jumping off point um, for the investigation. It's where the investigation starts, and then usually I'll if when I have that much, I'll sort of write in a bit of a fever, like 50 pages. I'll, I'll just kind of write everything I know about the story. And then I always stop after about 50 pages. I don't know what it is, but it's like, that's all, that's all I can do just on that kind of, you know, sort of like brainstorm high or something. And that's when I have to stop and do research and really think about the plot and think about who all the characters are and what they're doing there and who they are and their backgrounds and and kind of then put together the pieces of the plot. So you're kind of investigating the mystery yourself. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, I'm. I always um, there when people talk about uh, about structure and writing, they often will describe authors will describe themselves as either a plotter or a pantser. Um, you know, either you're someone who plots it out all ahead of time or you write by the seat of your pants, and you're either a plotter <laughs> or a pantser. And I'm a bit, you know, I'm a bit of a hybrid, I think, because I, I, there is a certain amount of pantsing there at the beginning, but then I do like to impose a little, a little structure. But I find those two, like when I've tried, in fact, almost every time I start a new book, I think, all right, this time I'm going to outline the whole thing. I'm going to know exactly what happens. Like I'm going to have my little notebook and I'm going to da, da, da. And it's, like, and it's just like, it, it never works. You know, it's like I have to write. I, I just always have to write it the wrong way before I figure out how to write it the right way. And I and I I see the the other writers in the room all nodding their heads. So I th I mean I think that's sadly I think that's just kind of part of the process. Like you, I, I don't know that a scene isn't the scene that should come next until I write it, and I say, oh darn, that what doesn't work, or I'm bored. I mean that's more what happens. I think is like I'll write a scene, and I in the middle of the scene, I'm like, I'm bored. Like, everyone else is going to be bored, too. Like, this is not the scene. Go back, figure out what scene does come next. Um, and do you so, know yeah. who, who did it in the beginning, or when so, do you know who did it? So Mary asked, when do I know who did it? Not, often not right away. I mean, sometimes I do know right away. But sometimes it takes a little bit of time to develop. Um, uh, you know, it, it, it's kind of a mix. Um, I, you, I, I don't get too far without knowing because there's so much that, you know, there's so much foreshadowing and clue dropping and all that that you kind of need to do. Um, but I don't always know right away. I don't always know right away. Yeah, Sue. So. Do you ever louse up and forget a character, you know, remember, oh no, I put that character in the wrong place, or, you know, screw <laughs> up everything, oh, I oh. forgot about him, or so, her. Uh, Sue asked, do you ever, you know, put a character in the wrong place, or forget about a character, or, and yeah, absolutely, I mean, 
copy editors <laughs> copy editors are angels you know they they just I, there's so many really embarrassing things that copy editors have caught for me over the years you know just yeah like characters who i introduce a character on page 20 and you know he's got a couple scenes and then he just like drops out of the book, <laughs> the book and you know and often that'll be more my my editor when she does her big sort of line conceptual edit but um you know she's like wait what happened to joe you know joe he, he seemed really promising there on page 20 but he's gone now um and yeah i mean so ma there's so many layers of that um in a you know 350 page book like people's eye color changing from one page to the next and you know people's names that names is one of the uh, that's so embarrassing and so confusing for the copy editors because sometimes I'll you know I'll change a name late in the process and miss a few you know so it's like there's somebody named you know Jennifer and then in like three places she's named Jean and the copy <laughs> editor's like who's Jean <laughs> but, you know but um yeah I mean I, editors are the best I love editors they help so much still what led you to write mysteries what led me to write mysteries um I you know I think that I always loved re I always loved reading mysteries um and, and just like had a really sort of pure enjoyment and like joy in reading them that seemed to me to be something I should translate into what I was trying to write, if that makes sense. You know, just like the way that when I read a really well-written, well-constructed mystery, I'm so interested in just all, like all the parts of it and how it works together and how the characters are, you know are both there to serve the plot but are, are should be so much more and have their own lives and so i think i think that was just a big part of it that i i really you know i read a lot of different stuff but i love i just love like i really take pleasure in reading crime fiction um and you know i i i i had tried to write a couple of non-crime novels um and I just sort of kept feeling like I, I kept losing my way in them. And there was something about the imposed structure of, uh, a, of a crime investigation, of a murder investigation that um, I found very satisfying um, for whatever reason and sort of allowed me to finish my first book. I think, you know, I had a lot of like half finished books and it was, I think it was when I kind of put that in place that I was actually able to finish a book. Yeah, hi, Dick. Hi. Do you um, speak book out loud? Hmm. So I, you know, that's a, a really great thing to do, actually. And I try to do it as much as I can. I never do it as much as I should or would like to. And I, I don't know exactly why. Like, it's, I mean, I think part of it is you have to have a quiet, empty house in order to do it un <laughs> unselfconsciously. <laughs> Although you guys wouldn't mind if I was talking to myself up in my office. No. Yeah, I always, and I think too, you know, I, I, I'm always like rushing to meet a deadline and that's maybe the part of the process that like gets pushed out at the end there, you know, but it's, it's such a great thing to do. And I have to say, ha having the book as an audio book um, has been so, you know, having all the books as audiobooks has been so interesting because hearing your own words, I mean, it's a little, it's hard to listen to sometimes, but um, it's, it, it's really valuable, I think. And you hear, you know, you hear like the things you fall back on and the patterns that you go to maybe once too many and you hear all that kind of stuff when you read it aloud. So, I, yeah, I always, I'm trying to do more of that because it's such a great technique. Um, for, uh, yeah. I don't. They they talk to themselves too. They're pretty. They're all pretty. You know. They're pretty forgiving. <laughs> Flynn. I was wondering how, so you've done four books really quickly. I was wondering how you're sustaining your energy, both 
sort of on an emotional level and then also on a practical level? How do you structure your year when you're promoting a book while editing a book, mm. while still promoting the previous one probably even? And so yeah, yeah, it's a really it's a really good question. And I mean, part of it is you know is like my family is very helpful and understanding. Um, uh, uh, seriously, like and, and that they're you know that they're they're bigger now and um, I could you know I couldn't I couldn't do it when they were when they were smaller I couldn't keep up that pace you know I couldn't do uh, that many books um, you know interestingly I think I think COVID actually was a positive in that one respect there are so many negatives but uh, there you know I sold the first book and the, so the mountains wild was pretty much done and then it came it was completely done and then it came out in June of 2020 and that was kind of the crunch time where it was like I was promoting that first book I was about to be promoting that first book and I had to write the second one and I was also sort of trying to write the third because I was trying to s sell the third and you know everything just <laughs> shut down and we were stuck at home for for all those all those months and months and so I think I got a lot I, you know I got quite a lot done then um, but it's a, the book a year thing is a it, you know it's it's what's expected of series crime writers and it's a big it's a big lift um, and you know right now it feels basically sustainable but I'm sure I'll reach you know, I'll sure, I'm sure I'll reach a point in a couple of years where I'll, I'll say, you know, I, gotta t I need to take a year off or um, I need, you know, I, I need to kind of recharge my creative energy. Um, but so far it's been okay. And I think writing a series helps because it's, the, the, uh, you know, I know those characters really well. And so I'm not starting from zero with kind of learning who they are and learning their background. Um, I can it's easy to kind of re-enter their world again because I know them pretty well. Um, so yeah, but I'll you know I'll let you know. I bet in a year or two I'll be I'll say oh, I need I need a break from it <laughs> from this pace. Caffeine. Yes, caffeine helps too. Yes, my husband <laughs> says caffeine. That's very true. Yes, Cora. Um, Yuna, she is poor but a good dancer, so. What is your favorite part of the writing process? Ooh, so Cora asks, what is my favorite part of the writing process? I think for me it's the, so it's like draft number three probably, where everything's in place, like it's basically there, and I can just go back and start adding in detail and like developing the characters more and it's where it kind of starts to come alive. Like I, I, the way I always describe it is that it's like I've written the play and I've put the actors on the stage, and that third draft is where I get to start like directing them and saying like, no, do it more this way or do it more this way or, you know, let's build some sets here and let you know. So I think you know that's depending on the book. That's like draft number three or four probably. But th I think that's my favorite part. That's the part that I find fun and that I actually like, can't wait to sit down at the computer. Whereas, you know, drafts one and two are just like slog. It's just slogging through. It's just getting the words down and um, getting, you know, just like building the sort of scaffolding of the structure of the book, you know. So, yeah, but that's a good question. I like that. Yeah. Um, what authors, uh, growing up and then into your adult life, what authors influenced you? Like, was there a particular author you read that kind of, as the mysteries and things like that? Or um, was there an author that influenced you to, to write that sort of book? To want to, want to write mystery yeah. novels, yeah. definitely. Um, so I, I mean, I love, you know, I, as a child, I loved Nancy Drew and I, you know, we had some, um, <laughs> we had some, some friends from, um, who my mom had some really close friends from Wales and they would send us, I don't know if you remember this, but they would send us e the Enid Blyton mysteries, which were these sort of British children's mysteries that were, um, that were in those days were harder to get in the States. And I, I loved those. Um, and then Agatha Christie and, you know, I, I definitely, like, I sort of read all of the, 
um, I don't remember when I was introduced to like jo Dorothy L. Sayers and Josephine Tay, but somewhere after Christie. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, P.D. James, I think, yeah. was, a, was a huge part of my wanting to write mysteries because, um, you know, especially the, the Cordelia Gray, I mean, I love the Daglish mysteries, but the Cordelia Gray mysteries were just, it was like this character, this young woman who was, you know, took on this private investigation business under these horrible circumstances. And she was just, the mysteries were, the mysteries were great, but it was so, so much about her. And I think they showed me that mysteries could be character driven and could really be um, as rich and as, you know, as sort of multifaceted as any, any non-mystery novel. So P.D. James was definitely a huge influence. Um, and then, you know, it's funny, like I, I definitely didn't read mystery then for a while. I think when I was in college and, and graduate school to a certain extent, I just, I, you know, once in a while for pleasure, but I really kind of, you know, I think I internalized the sense of like, it's not serious, it's not, you know. Um, and when I came back to it, it was with more contemporary crime writers and, you know, which was just, there, there was just like this explosion of great crime writing, I think, in the, you know, in the sort of late 90s, early 2000s. And, um, you know, certainly, I, you know, there's so many Irish crime writers mm -hmm. who I absolutely love. Um, there are so many British crime writers. There are, you know, p people like, um, one of my absolute favorite writers right now who I recommend to everybody is um, Attica Locke. Has anybody read Attica Locke? She writes, she's only written two in the series that I love the most, but she's written, um, she, you know, she's written a couple of different things and some standalones, but she writes this series um, uh, called, I forget, it's like Root, does anybody, does anybody know Root 60 something in Texas? It's, they're set in East Texas. And they're about a black Texas ranger who is just the most compelling character. And the, they're so beautifully written. And she's, I just, I, I like worship her. They're so good. Um, yeah, I mean, there's so many. There's so many, yeah. yeah. Um, of one of the authors that I also recently stolen, um, yeah. she has a great character, Molly Murphy. And I love what really attracted me to your books is it's a modern day character that has as much depth as that and she's just like she's so human like you can relate to her even though you know obviously i'm not in Ireland, although i would hope to be yeah. um, and she's but. she's an irish character who comes to america yes. right yeah which is kind of which is fun yeah i love i'm i'm really interested in for obvious reasons like i'm really interested in those sort of outsider characters who are you know who are someone who goes somewhere else where they, where they don't where they don't fit in and right and they're trying to yeah Valerie um, it makes me think Sarah your comments it just like you just said um, of would you take the characters to another place or another continent like for example I think of all the amazing Irish aid workers that work with organizations like Trocare and all of those and, that are so compelling human beings working on human rights or whatever. And there's lots of mysteries involved in their lives. Yeah, I, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting with mysteries because, with series, because I think as, as the writer, I, I would love to take my character all over the world. You know, I'd love to like do one, I mean, and it's not just about the research trips. Like, <laughs> it would, I think it would be really interesting to like take her to, to Tokyo in one book and then take her somewhere, you know. Um, but it's funny, readers often want, re, you know, readers like you to put your character in a place and to get to know that place really, really well. And they feel, and I, you know, I understand it as a reader. Like I, I don't know if there are any other Anne Cleves fans here, but you know, when you go, when you open up one of her uh, Jimmy Perez novels, and you know, you're you're back in the Shetland Islands, and you recognize the islands, and you recognize the people and the places, and you know, it's so much fun. And so I think, you know, often I think editors and the marketing people and <laughs> the people at the publishing company do have this sense that like they want. They want you to kind of find your place for your characters, and um, but I, I do think there's some flexibility within that, and you know, um, 
I certainly, you know, I'd love to take Maggie over to the continent. You know, now that she's in Ireland, I'd love to take her, you know, maybe she has to go to Spain to investigate something. And, you know, who knows? We'll, we'll see. But Portugal. Oh, but you, you'd like to go to Portugal. Okay. <laughs> we'll do Portugal. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any yeah. other questions? Yes. Well, I'm, I'm always interested in how you have had to adjust to new technology mm -hmm. in oh. police work and, yeah. and so on. And how quickly do you put something new in? Yep. And are the readers disappointed that now she's something's made easier maybe by something? Yeah. Is she going to wear a body camera? Right. That's no. It's such a good question. So, so my dad's question was, um, how do you adjust to new, new technology, and when do you know when to put new police technology in, you know, into the books? How long do you wait? How how what what makes it in? And um, yeah, it's really it, it, it's really challenging, and it's cha you know I think for for many years, the the new technology was sort of happening in labs, and it was happening outside of the public's eye, whereas you're absolutely right. Now, you know, there's, there's this whole discussion of body cameras. And so how, when do body camera, uh, when does body camera footage become a part of police investigations? Like, it's, al it's already there. It's already happening. Um, not everywhere. But, um, I mean, another example is in, in Ireland, and really in most, most European countries, um, there is very widespread CCTV uh, presence, right? Like almost everywhere you go in, uh, in a European city and in many smaller places as well, you are, you are almost constantly under video surveillance. And law enforcement can use that video surveillance to, to investigate. Um, and it's a, it's a benefit that they have. Um, Ireland is actually, especially in the rural places, is, is actually a little bit behind um, you know, the UK and, and some other countries. But there's a lot of it, and much more than there is here, and much more than we would tolerate here in the United States. And so that's a like a really interesting difference um, that I've had to kind of check with my law enforcement sources and say, like, you know, would there like would they have access to this footage? Would they have access to that footage? Um, you know, th I mean, the other fascinating thing for me writing a series in Ireland is that it, the policing is really different. Um, you know, Ireland has a national police force, whereas we have sort of, you know, very localized um, city, town, um, county police forces. And the, and the differences between those two ways of policing are really, it, like, they make their way into plots in very interesting ways. Um, you know, whether it's b detectives getting transferred uh, between stations across Ireland or, you know, just things like that, like the, the course of your career would be very different. Um, and of course, uh, you know, uniformed uh, Garda patrol officers don't carry guns. And that's, it's a really, you know, as I'm writing scenes where they're interacting with members of the public, it's a really different relationship and a really different dynamic than in an American set series where an armed police officer is interacting with a member of the public, and so you know there are like little things like that that are, um, are you know that are I find are really fun actually to research and to kind of figure out. And um, but yeah, the technology you know like DNA technology is one of the like 15 years ago investigations used it, but it took a long time and it wasn't always accessible to investigators right away and now you know they can they can use it as an investigative tool pretty they get it pretty quick um, and that's that's changed the way you know they investigate homicides so yeah good question yes i find it so interesting that in each book some contemporary issues that seem to be the issues right at the time like well, the mountains wild, of course, the Me Too movement was going on, and then Afghanistan, and it disintegrated. But you start with place. So does that just sort of come as you're writing the book, or how does that? That's a good, that's a good question. The question was about um, sort of the current issues that make their way into the books, and, uh, and how, wh where those come in. You know, 
I, it's a good, I, I, I don't have a great answer for that. I think, I think sometimes it just comes out of the characters and it's thinking, it's also thinking about like when the book is set. You know, I've, uh, like I've created a pretty specific timeline for these books. So the first book was 2016. The second one is right after the inauguration in 2017. And so some of the, you know, issues around immigration and, um, you know, xenophobia that are in that book are, you know, are, it, it was because that's what was in the air then. So I think that's part of it. And certainly the, the Me Too content in, um, in the Mountains Wild, absolutely. Like that was, that was going on when I was writing it. That was going on, when, you know. Um, so yeah, that's a bit, it's, it's a little, it's, it's hard to pin down exactly where that comes from. Anything else? You guys have been very patient and have had excellent questions, but um, it was so nice to see you all. It was so nice to be in person, and I would love to sign books. So please feel free to um, to, to bring up books. And, oh, thank you.